So again, I'm Britt Forsberg with the Minnesota Bee Atlas. We're talking about bumblebee identification today. Bee Atlas funded by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So we are a citizen science project. We engage volunteers across Minnesota in helping us document the diversity and distribution of native bees. So a little bit about how this session will go is that we'll start with some basic information on bumblebee ecology. Hopefully a lot of you had a chance to go through that short tutorial. There are ID groups. We'll start with the easiest ones, work our way up to things that are a little more challenging. And then we'll talk about different ways that you can use your newfound knowledge to contribute uh, to science across Minnesota in particular, but of course anywhere that you see bumblebees. So this graphic is pretty busy. There's a lot and potentially where you are, I know you're not able to read all of that text, but it's a pie chart of different, different bee species in the US. I just wanna draw your attention up here to the small sliver that of all of the species, the 3,600 or so species of bees in the US, uh, only 50 of them are bumblebees or honeybees, the bees that were probably most familiar with that we notice that when you bring up a picture of a bee in your head, um, that's what it would be. Otherwise, there's tremendous diversity in size, in color. Uh, you can see actually very few of these bees here are the yellow and black stripes that we think of when we draw cartoon bees. But there are bees that look more like flies. There are flies that look more like bees. It's a pretty big world out there. So bumblebees, our northern creatures, we're lucky in Minnesota to have pretty great bumblebee diversity. On this map, the darker red colors are the areas that have more different species of bumblebees. So if you look at it, we can compare Minnesota, the sort of red in this red section, to somewhere like the Amazon. Now, of course, Minnesota is way behind the Amazon on general biodiversity. Right, there are many, many more species in the rainforest than we have here, but we have more different bumblebee species. So bumblebees have adapted to a climate similar to Minnesota in a couple different ways. The most obvious when you look at them, they're covered in hairs, so that keeps them warm. Uh, the queens are, have a kind of antifreeze in their blood, and so when they hibernate over winter, they won't freeze. But hibernating over winter is another adaptation the fact that they have an annual life cycle. So they're not trying to keep an entire colony fed, warm, active over the winter. It is just individuals. So to look at that, this graphic here. So we are up right now in May in Minnesota. We're somewhere between the upper left and sort of left middle. So an individual queen who had hibernated would come out. I've still seen plenty of queens, but they've been out for some species almost a month. And so I suspect that they're kind of moving down here to this nest building stage. So the queen who overwintered by herself had mated at the end of last season in the fall. Uh, she stored that sperm with her so that she can start building her nest and laying eggs with that sperm. Uh, this first batch of eggs, she will fertilize. Bees have the option to fertilize or not fertilize their eggs, and that determines the sex of the offspring. So the first eggs she lays are fertilized eggs, so they will be female bumblebees as her first offspring. Um, she'll tend to these eggs, these larvae, for about 21 days, and then they'll mature into adults. These are the workers. So once the queen has that first batch of worker bees, she no longer has to leave the nest. She doesn't have to do the foraging to bring back pollen or nectar or build more wax cups. She can just lay eggs and those workers will do the foraging. Um, they'll build the wax cups. They'll feed the larvae. So if we move counterclockwise, uh, now there are other bees caring for that nest. If we get up here towards the top right corner, uh, this is the end of the season. So sometime 
maybe end of July, August, September, depends on the year, depends on the species. Um, but two different things will happen in that colony. One is that the queen will start laying male eggs. These are unfertilized eggs. And then new female eggs that she lays will become queens. Uh, what differentiates a queen from a worker is how much they're fed. So the end of the summer, usually there are more floral resources. So these larvae can be fed quite a bit more. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <coughs> the male bees will leave the colony and mate with a new queen from a different colony. Yet those new queens after they've mated will hibernate, but the rest of the bees from that colony will die. So the original queen who started that colony will die. Uh, the workers will die. Even the males will die. And so it's just those mated queens who live to next year. So what time those species emerge uh, those queens emerge will be different per the species. Again, it is always the queens, the workers, then the males, and you could add in new queens along with those males. But there are some species that tend to be very early species and some that'll start later in the year. <clears throat> Brett, we uh, do have a question. I, I don't know if you know off the top of your head about how many queens are raised from each colony per year. I have no idea. I would think that it's pretty variable. The colony size will depend on the species, but it'll also depend on the floral resources that year. You know, if it's a, a year with a lot of flowers, a lot of pollen and nectar, there'll be more queens, uh, just because they can bring back more pollen, more nectar for those offspring. And if it's maybe a really dry year or something where there aren't many flowers, there'll be fewer. Um, but I don't have a good idea on you know, what, a, what a number is for that. Sure, and there was a question of, are the new queens due to fertilized eggs at the end of the year? So yes, they are fertilized eggs because they're females and then they're fed a different diet. And then the question of, do queens look the same as other females? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll actually get to that as we keep going when we look at individual species. Uh, most of them do. But as we try to identify species, we have to know a little bit about the bee morphology. So we have some vocab uh, and knowing where to look at these pictures. So a couple of things that we'll need to pay attention to right away when we're looking at determining we even have a bee or a bumblebee in front of us. Looking at their eyes, these longer, sort of narrower, uh, compound eyes and the size of their head. Noticing the three body parts, the head, the thorax, the abdomen, all insects have three body parts. We'll look at the wings. Uh, when we talk about a pollen basket, that's down here, the hindmost leg on females, uh, this kind of widened triangular section. It'll be, it's not easy to see on this hand drawing, uh, but the middle will be shiny. There won't be hairs. There are just hairs at the edges. Uh, yeah, can okay, we'll get into more more about that? So of course this couldn't be easy. So you can't always pick out a bee or a bumblebee just with a quick visual search. So none of the pictures on this page are actually bees. Couple things to look out for. Uh, picture three, four, and five are all flies. Uh, sorry, two, three, four, five are all flies. So differences from bees are that they have huge eyes. So most of the head is taken up by those eyeballs. Uh, short stubby antennae coming from the middle of the head. Bees will have longer antennae. Uh, they have an elbowed joint just like your elbow, they might not always bend it, uh, but it can bend. The other thing, these flies all have two wings, just one pair, one on each side, while bees will have two pairs, two wings on each side. Of course, it's not always easy to see those either. They can zip them together, uh, but kind of holding in that V shape is a good determination for flies too. Aha, a question about picture number two. Yes, 
if that were indeed a bumblebee eating a honeybee, that would be incredibly strange behavior, right? Because bees are eating pollen and nectar. Uh, they are not uh, eating other insects. So yes, that is a robber fly. It is a very good mimic. So it's managed to have the same coloring, look fuzzy, and have a similar shape to bumblebees. Picture number one is a wasp. So they are closely related to bees, but because they're not collecting pollen, they are not hairy. They're usually long, smooth bodies. Uh, and then picture number six is a clear wing moth. So they're kind of big, fuzzy, and they can have the black and yellow coloring like a bumblebee. Uh, but you can't see those three body parts very well. And if you can get close, the mouth parts are very different too. So again, some of those fly characteristics, looking at those antennae. In the last photo, they were all kind of short stubby ones. This one, they're a little more plumose. Uh, flies are incredibly diverse and can look very, very different. But it's not that long elbow joint or elbowed antennae that a bee would have. On the hind legs, there are no pollen baskets, nowhere for them to carry the pollen. Again, the way that they're, this bee or this wasp fly goodness, is holding wings, it's hard to see that they're just one pair, uh, but a big difference. And again, those large eyeballs. So another example here. Again, and some of them have gotten very good at mimicking color patterns. Uh, I think behavior is often a way that I can distinguish these out in the field or even indoors. I've seen mimics like this on the inside of the glass. So they act a lot like uh, houseflies, kind of that rubbing of the front legs together, much more of a fly trait. This clearing moth. Again, we can't see those three body parts. Even if it is kind of round, fluffy like a bumblebee, we still need to be able to see the differentiation. So if we if thought it felt easy to distinguish bees from non-bees, now we'll add some bees that are similar to bumblebees. Quickly go through how to tell them apart. So this is a carpenter bee. We do have them in Minnesota. Um, you know, in the Twin Cities, I don't think I've ever seen one. We're kind of the top, Minnesota in general is the top part of their range. They're more common further south. But so again, the similar coloring, the yellow fuzz, uh, black abdomen could look like a bumblebee. You know, that similar shape. But a couple of things to look out for in particular, uh, this hindmost leg, see how the whole thing is hairy? There's no pollen basket. There's no widened triangle section, no smooth area um, to put a ball of pollen. The other thing in the abdomen, although it is black, like some of the bumblebee species, they tend to be much smoother. They're not covered in hairs like a bumblebee. Um, the males will have yellow on their face, um, but usually it's, a, it's just the, their skin, essentially, integument. So uh, in a bumblebee, the males can have yellow on the faces too, but it's big shocks of hair. Uh, and the last one, and this one I actually see coming across on things like iNaturalist uh, pretty frequently identified as bumblebees. Andrina, this is a genus of bees, the family Andrenidae. A lot of them are early season bees, and so there have been quite a few out recently. Again, they can have that fuzzy yellow thorax, black abdomen, but just like the carpenter bee, uh, they do not have those pollen baskets. They have hairs on their legs to carry pollen. That abdomen is smooth and uh, they are quite a bit narrower than bumblebees and carpenter bees. All right, I know I went through that. Hopefully you were able to look at that tutorial. And so you have some more resources, but of this picture, or these five pictures, sorry. I want to identify which one is the bee. I will add a poll. Uh, you may need to slide your own poll window over so you can see the pictures. Where I have it on my screen, it doesn't affect where it is on your screen. So 
So thinking about those things, about the number of wings, the antennae, the eyes, pollen baskets. You can pitch, pick which one looks like a bee to you. Thanks to those of you who've already put your answers up. Uh, we're about halfway there, it looks like, of people who have been able to vote. It looks like voting has slowed down. Oh, that's totally fine if you didn't feel confident adding an ident identification or if you had to walk away. So I was not able to fool anybody with photo B. No one chose that one. So working them through, letter A is a fly. And it looks very much, it has that shape of a bumblebee with these large eyes. Smaller, looks like kind of plumose antennae in the middle. Uh, no pollen basket. B, also a fly. C is a wasp. Again, an elongated body, smooth with no hairs. D is a fly. It has done a wonderful job of mimicking the color pattern of the hairs of a bumblebee. But again, these large, large eyes short antennae right here in the middle and then there's only one wing on each side no pollen basket back here but letter e is a b a wool carter b so you can see some hairs on the legs it is a bit of an unfair angle most of the pollen collecting hairs for this b are on the underside of the abdomen but there are these again the long antennae uh, two pairs of wings. All right, so not too bad. Next up, if I can make my slide go, there we go, is which one of these is a bumblebee? Oh, sorry, it'd be easier for you to take that poll if I actually launched it, wouldn't it? So same thing, pick the letter of the photo that you think is a bumblebee. Remembering that if you, can, if you need to, you can move that poll window to the side so you can see all those photos. Oh, thanks for troubleshooting that, Claire. All right, this one might be a little easier. Uh, votes seem to be coming in more quickly this time. So another 10 seconds up to about a minute. We have, looks like most people have gotten their votes in. All right, so most people, it looks like, got it right. Photo D is the bumblebee. Uh, we can't see the pollen basket, that smooth space, because it's covered in a huge ball of pollen. <laughs> but looking, so we'll start at the beginning, letter A, another Andrina. So again, has black and yellow, has fuzz on the thorax, but the abdomen is smooth. Photo B a, is a longhorned bee. Of course, these long antennae give it its common name. Photo C is a carpenter bee. You can look at that hindmost leg and see how the pollen is held just on those hairs. It's not packed in a ball to be in a pollen basket. And then we talked about D. All right, nice work. So 
uh, feel free to put any questions in the chat. If you'd like to unmute and ask right now, you may do that as well. Otherwise, we'll get into some of the more common, uh, or a couple more features that we need to help with ID. Um, but again, this is your chance for questions. I'll go ahead and assume that uh, you guys are all experts identifying bumblebees by now, right? Since there are no questions. Ha ha, the world gets, it's one of those things, the more you know, the less you realize you know. Uh, so just a couple of things as we get into these individual species, things to pay attention to is the shape of the face. So there are, these are three, three photos starting on the left, what a long faced uh, bumblebee would look like the middle sort of medium, and the far right, a very short face. So really what we're looking at when we do this is there's a space called the malar, I've heard it said malar space, um, between the bottom of the eye and their mandible. Uh, it could also be called the cheek. And so how long that space is kind of influences the overall look of how long the face is. And, you know, there are a lot of ID guides that will specify cheek is longer than it is wide or wider than it is long. And sometimes that's one of those characteristics that you really need to have a specimen in the lab for. Uh, right in the field, you're not going to be able to measure how many millimeters <coughs> each direction is. But again, looking at that overall shape can be helpful. Uh, as we move through that guide to bumblebees, uh, the hairs on the front of the face and the top of the head will be mentioned. So it's always hard to, of course, render a 3D image in two dimensions. But so this half circle here would be the front of the face. And then what kind of looks like it's on the neck, again, on this 2D drawing, is what they mean by top of the head. Uh, so thorax, where the wings are, looking at, in particular, the wing bases, uh, where the hairs change from yellow to black. And the abdomen, uh, these sections here, that there are six sections in female bumblebees and seven in males. Uh, Angie, can you make, take your best guess <laughs> at the word you want spelled? Oh, Mailer, yes, you've got it right there. So uh, again, mentioning that females have six segments to their abdomens uh, males have seven. In general, males' abdomens just look longer, uh, often pointier. Uh, distinguishing the males and females becomes important if you use the bee guide that I sent out, because one side is for males, one side for females. In some species, it doesn't matter as much because males and females can look very similar, but in some of the species, they're completely different. And so if you try to follow the key for the wrong sex, you'll never get to the right answer. So in addition to the longer abdomens, male bees uh, and wasps too will also have longer antennae. They have one more segment, which is not something that you'll see in the field, where of course that they're pretty small, hard to count, but in general, those antennae just look longer. Uh, looking at their hind legs, the females have that pollen basket that we've talked about, the smooth depression, where they would hold the ball of pollen. The males are not doing any work in the nest. They're not bringing back pollen. They're not taking care of offspring. And so they don't need to collect hairs there, or pollen there. So their hindmost leg will be hairy, kind of convex. It'll sort of bulge outward a little bit. And the hairs are pretty uniform length. Some males will have very large eyes. Uh, this is because they have a perching behavior where well, they'll sit on the end of a piece of grass maybe or a branch uh, and then wait for females to come by to mate with them. It does mean that when we do this class in person with specimens, we have other couple of species where we're short on male specimens. Now those big eyes, of course, it's easy to see those females coming. It's also easy to see you and your net coming. And so they are harder to collect sometimes. Now the last difference, I mean that females have a stinger and males do not. Uh, I would say that 
One of the questions that I get frequently, people have heard, if a bee stings you, then they die. Uh, this is actually only, only for honeybees. Honeybee workers have a barb at the end of their stinger, and so it will stay in whatever has been stung so that it pumps the venom into them. Uh, as they fly away, it pulls their bodies apart. But bumblebees and other native bees have smooth stingers. They can sting multiple times. Uh, but they, in general, do not tend to be aggressive. Most bees are solitary. They don't have a colony to defend. And even bumblebees, you have to get pretty up close and personal with their nest to get stung. They're not, if they're out on a flower, uh, they want to be out collecting pollen or nectar. They're not aggressive there. Rick, can you comment on that question? Um, just, I'm not sure about the seasonality. Are males only produced at the end of the season? Yes, so again, males, males are produced towards the end of a colony's life cycle. Their one job is to go out and mate with another new queen from a different colony. But they are uh, not helping their original colony survive just passing on genetic material. So here we've seen the pollen basket on a bee that had, was carrying pollen, again, that big orange ball. Uh, and this is what it would look like with no pollen. So we're comparing the female leg on the left to the male on the right. And the male does not have that triangular shape. The hairs are pretty evenly spread. Nowhere that it would carry pollen. Example, we talked about those male bumblebees that have very large eyes. This top left photo is an example. Uh, still not as large as some of those fly pictures we looked at. Yeah, but when you have specimens, they're fairly obvious. And down here on the lower right, kind of what normal, regular, medium eyes look like. So again, still large, but not, not as noticeable as the males that have very large eyes. So we'll put a couple of photos up and see how well you are at distinguishing male and female. I don't have polls for these, so just go ahead and put your guesses in the chat. Remember things that you can look for, you can look for long antennae, you can look for long abdomens, sometimes pointy. Uh, that hindmost leg, is there a pollen basket? That widened space where they would carry the pollen, smooth in the middle, Triangular shaped. All right. I see a lot of male answers coming in. Yep, that one, that one is a male. At this angle, it's pretty easy to see those longer antennae. Um, you can see that the hindmost leg does not widen into that strong triangle shape. Um, with the lighting, it's a little harder to see maybe if there's a depression on the leg. It's, I've pulled the best photos I have, but it is almost impossible to get one B photo that shows you every single thing that you want. <laughs> Again, sort of that rendering 3D and 2D problem. All right, so how about this one? While you're adding your answers there, I'll kind of scroll them, but I did see a question about male bumblebees knowing if a female is from a different colony. I would assume that they have, that they use pheromones, but that's a guess on my part. I don't know if they are always 100% sure it's a different female or how they would determine that. All right, guess is coming in, look good. This is a female. Those orange balls of pollen. Again, you can't see your pollen baskets, but they're definitely there. That's how the pollen's sticking. Harder to see the abdomen, uh, the antennae from this angle don't look terribly long. All right. Also, I saw a question about how you can determine there are four wings. 
Yeah, and again, when they're folded, this can be hard, but sometimes it can be easier if you look to see two wing bases right next to each other on each side. Again, isn't going to be obvious on every photo, but nice job. And one more, male or female. It looks like our answers are slowing down there in the chat. So the main characteristic to look over here uh, is the hind leg. And so we can see that widened triangular space, but there are no hairs here, just the hairs on the edge. All right, please don't feel bad if you didn't get all of them right. Uh, I had to, I shadowed three years, I think, of Elaine Evans Bumblebee classes before I felt confident enough to teach this on my own, before I spent enough time in the field doing the work. So unfortunately, I can't bless you as experts at the end of this hour and a half. Uh, it is something that just takes some practice. So go ahead if you have last minute questions on male and female, otherwise we will start looking at individual species. Okay, if you were able to print out that guide, um, it'd be handy to have it near you now. If not, I understand. When we do this in person, I bring copies, but of course, with 200 people who uh, sign up at all different times, unfortunately, I'm not able to mail you all copies. So this guide is written similar to a dichotomous key, but there are sometimes more than two options. So we'll look at how to use it where the first, first thing to choose is looking at these, the text in red. So which of those four characteristics most closely describes the bee that you're looking at? Once you've determined which section to work under, uh, then you look at the numbers. So if we had to said that there were yellow hairs between the wings, the first abdominal band, ye band yellow, then you have to decide if one, two, three, four, five, or six most closely described your bee. And sometimes, once you've read the number, you can come down to identification. Sometimes there are more characteristics. So if we're kind of on this middle row here, you'd have to look at the longer text for each one of those. Uh, the color patterns are not always um, Rel they're mostly reliable characteristics, but there are some species that are pretty variable. Sometimes that's that individual has always looked a little different. Sometimes it's kind of what time in the year it is. By the end of the season, the bees can start look a little looking a little more battered. Some of the black might look a bit more brown. Sometimes the hairs were worn off. And so when you think you're seeing a black spot between the wings, it's not actually black hairs, it's just their black integument. So uh, you do need to follow all those steps. It's just like identifying any other organism. If you just flip open your field guide and go by picture and say, yeah, that one. Uh, it may or may not be the organism you're looking at. I used to be an elementary science teacher and somehow students always ended up with, you know, the most rare endangered or you know, South American species instead of, you know, um, whatever it was looking at. So again, just flipping and finding the picture that matches isn't always helpful. So the first species that we'll look at is Bombus impatiens, common Eastern bumblebee. This is one where males and females do look similar. Uh, so the, the heads will be a little different. Males have yellow at the top and the front, while females have black hairs in the front, but they both have a yellow thorax with some yellow hairs between. And then their abdomens, that first section is yellow, 
while the rest is black. Uh, this is one in particular where it seems like a lot of the times that black spot between the wings, uh, those hairs will get worn off. And again, you're actually looking at kind of the, the bee equivalent of skin beneath. So be aware of that. Uh, they're a lighter, more lemony color than some other bees. So sometimes that can be a clue as well. So a shot here, again, you see just that one yellow segment and the rest is black. A couple of little yellow hairs in here. And that's just that there's some variance in species. So next up, Bombus vimaculatus, the two-spotted bumblebee. Uh, bees, <laughs> there's not a lot of really clever common names. And so the two-spotted bumblebee, it's because you can see these two spots on the second abdominal section. So another one where males and females are pretty similar. Uh, the male image down here has some kind of yellow inner sparse hairs. That's a morph. You'll see sometimes, sometimes it will be more black, um, but it's here to just show that there's variety. So the first abdominal section is all yellow for both males and females. The second is black on the sides, yellow in the middle. Usually with those two spots or W shape, uh, sometimes it can be a little more clear than other times. But again, looking at the sides of the abdomen. So does the yellow extend or not? So again, in this case, when you see it from the side, you would see that black. So that's not looking quite as dotty, but still kind of that W, yellow middle, black on the sides. And this black spot here in that first segment, the not black hairs, but noticing that it's just a lack of hairs. Uh, they're one of the earliest spring bumblebees here in Minnesota. Next up is Bombus griseocolis, the brown belted bumblebee. This is one of the most common bees that I get questions about when people uh, think or hope that they've found rusty patch bumblebees because they do have brown on their abdomens. Uh, but like the other two that we've looked at so far, their thorax will be yellow with some yellow hair or some black hairs between. The first abdominal segment will be entirely yellow. On the second segment, the sides are black and the middle is kind of a yellow and brown mixture. That can vary a little bit in size. Sometimes it's a little smaller, sometimes it's a little wider. Uh, but it's kind of going from front to back. It'll be yellow, brown, black. And that part is important to remember to keep it straight from the rusty patch bumblebee, which will have a little more yellow um, that we'll see a bit later. This is one of those species where those males have really big eyes. In general, I think they kind of look beefy, um, kind of broader thoraxes. Uh, Elaine Evans will describe this kind of having a crew cut. The hairs look a little shorter, a little stiffer. Uh, and so that's sometimes how things end up being identified, kind of looking, well, just, it, it looks like grizzly colis, right? One of those things that takes a lot of practice. <laughs> so a comment, the belt is maybe more of a fanny pack, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't go around uniformly. I'll have to use that one. I'll credit you, Angie D, next time. So a photo, you know, you can see that brown, um, again, that kind of broadened, beefy thorax. The hairs aren't very long there. All right. So I've already lied to you, as it turned out, by telling you that all females have pollen baskets. So we have a couple of species. Uh, we're just gonna look at this one. It's the most common, uh, but we have several cuckoo bees in Minnesota. So cuckoo bumblebees do not take care of their own nests. They are not foraging for nectar and pollen to bring back to their offspring. Uh, they go into the nest of another bumblebee, uh, often kill that other queen, 
and then lay their eggs and have the original uh, worker bees, the host bees, take care of their offspring. So they do not have a widened hind leg. They don't have that smooth pollen basket because they're not getting, collecting pollen on their own. But the females will still have six abdominal segments versus the seven of males. They'll still have the 12 antennal segments, not the 13 of males. And so just a reminder that it's helpful to keep, to look at all of these characteristics, not to always rely on just one. So I see a question about cuckoos. What do cuckoo bumblebees eat? Uh, they will eat nectar and pollen themselves, the adults on flowers. Pollen has more protein and nectar has more carbohydrates. So the difference is just that they're not collecting it. So cuckoo bumblebees tend to have wide heads. And so that's one, one thing you can use to distinguish them. Uh, the abdomens tend to not have as many hairs as other bumblebees. Again, no pollen baskets. But here, this is the first one that we've gotten to so far today, where the males and the females look very different. And so the females, the entire abdomen is black, it's kind of little yellow patches in the side. And then the males, the first three segments will be yellow. Get to a photo here. So this one is a female. You can see mostly black on the abdomen. And those kind of yellow tufts sticking a little bit on the side. Cuckoo bumblebees do seem to be pretty host uh, specific. And so the lemon cuckoo bumblebee, Bama citrinus, is probably the most, well, probably, it is <laughs> the most common cuckoo bumblebee in Minnesota. So looking at its hosts, Bombus impatiens, the maculatus, and Bombus vagans that we have not gotten to yet, the hosts are common bees. Many of the other cuckoo bees are, their hosts are bees that are not very common. Uh, in particular, the cuckoo bee that is host specific with the rusty patch bumblebee, which is federally endangered, uh, it may no longer be in Minnesota at all. And as the hosts decline, the nest parasites decline even more. So we'll put up some photos. Uh, if you feel confident in a guess, you can go ahead and put it in the chat, either male or female, if you feel good about the species. Uh, if you just wanna look and ponder silently. That's one of the nice part about a chat like this, right? Is if you're wrong, by the time three more people have commented, your comment is already gone. And so the risk, it's not like you're in person and you raise your hand and feel like everyone's turning around and staring at you uh, if you don't get it right. It's pretty low. And we're all here to learn. We're all here to get better at identification. So I'll kind of talk through some of the characteristics you're paying attention to. Uh, one, for male or female, we can look at the antennae, how long they are. We can look at that hindmost leg. Does it widen into a triangle? Does it have hairs kind of uniformly spread? When you look at the species, most that we've looked at so far will have the first stripe yellow. So it's really the second abdominal segment that we're looking at. Are the sides of it yellow? Are they black? Uh, kind of what's happening in the middle? All right, so this one is, a, I know that some of you may have not had time to get your guesses in, but we're gonna try to stay, stay on time today. Uh, the length of these webinars is always a little iffy, it depends on how many questions we have, but I'll try to get you out right around 2.30. Uh, so this is a male Griseocolis, the male brown-belted bumblebee. Long antennae, um, no pollen baskets, and that really brought in beefy thorax. It's hard, we can't quite see that brown section here under the wings. So one of those where we have to go based on some of the shape 
Most of them are black. Okay, how about this one? Again, if you just feel, if you want to stick with male or female, that's what you feel confident in, go ahead, add those comments. And if you think you know the species, we'll take those too. I think that's a male by Magnavatus. All right, so another male we can't see. A pollen basket here. This one is impatience. Impatience. So the first segment is yellow. It's not straight across. It has that little wave, which may have thrown some of you off. Uh, but one of the spots, again, you can see here, they're not necessarily yellow hair or black hairs between the wings. That's a place where the hairs have worn off. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not a male, it's a female. Oops. All right, you know, let's, looking at the time, uh, we will skip these. I'll give you a little bit for questions. And then we have, again, two more ID groups left. And then uh, a little bit about how to participate in citizen or community science. But again, slides will be available after the fact. Um, a link to the Bee Atlas resource page where you can find identification flashcards, and so you can practice that way too. Those are kind of nice. You have a little more time to do it instead of waiting until I rush you on to the next photo. So questions so far on the groups, on those bumblebees we've covered. I have a question, um, not necessarily on sure. the photographs, but um, my question is, well, I'm new to this, and in watching bees, um, you know, it's one thing to look at these pictures and have a moment to really, um, you know, discern one thing or another. And even then I'm not that, that good at it. So I'm just wondering if you have any um, hints for doing that. Sure, I would say some of that is unfortunately practice, right? <laughs> taking the time uh, to be able to see them. If, depending on where you are, uh, so, We'll talk a little bit more about the rusty patch bumblebee later, Chris being a federally endangered species. If you are in an area where you're likely to come across rusty patch bumblebees, you do need a permit to be able to handle them. And so if, you know, the whole metro, just the whole metro areas in that area, so I wouldn't advise it here. But different places in greater Minnesota, uh, if you're not part of that area covered by rusty patch bumblebee, you can catch bees just in a small Tupperware cup. It's pretty easy. Again, they're not aggressive if they're out on flowers. If you hold the cup upside down above a flower, they even tend to fly up. You can slide the lid on. And then you can put them in a cooler with ice. You could put them in the fridge for a couple minutes. I mean, 10 minutes. Uh, this slows them down. And then they'll sit still and you're more able to see some of those characteristics. I'd say when people are taking pictures, um, I know some people will take video and then they'll be able to pull one frame from that and then they're able to see the things that they need to see. Um, for this first group, they are, I would say not too bad to identify in person. Um, that brown, when you, when they're flying around, you get to see more of those angles. They're kind of pluses and minuses, right? In a photo, but in person, you will get a better idea of the color patterns of their shapes just because you see the whole bee. I hope that was helpful. All right, we will move on. Thank you, Claire, for putting that up there. Oh, look at that, helping. All right, so the next group of bumblebees that are a little harder, but still, still pretty manageable. For the most part, not things that you're going to need a, um, that you're gonna need a microscope or a specimen for. So I, there was a bit of chatter about Bombus ternarius, the tricolored bumblebee. These are ones that actually, uh, you can tell from a pretty good distance because those orange segments, segments two and three, 
are usually pretty bright. So the females, if you look at this black segment between the wing bases, how it comes back into a thumbtack shape or kind of a mushroom. Now that's one good characteristic to look for. And the fact that the abdominal stripes are very clear, that is exactly that stripe. The hairs aren't mixed up. They don't blend together in between, um, but it's one entire yellow segment, two entire orange segments, one complete yellow segment, and then the rest will be black. Uh, more common in Northern Minnesota, I monitored a bumblebee route near Embarrass last year, and these were by far the most common bee that I collected. So looking at a photo of this female, you can see how that black spot goes backward and then just how bright those yellow hairs are. So there is one bee that does look similar that could be confusing, but if you look at this picture, their ranges are very different. So Bombus huntii, uh, we just have a few specimens from kind of near the North Dakota border. Uh, so you would not expect to see them widespread across northern Minnesota. The abdomens are similar, one yellow stripe, two orange stripes, one yellow stripe, and then black. Uh, but the females do not have that thumbtack shape. And then both the front and tops of the heads are yellow. But again, uh, geography would be one of your biggest clues there. So next up is Bombus rufosinctus, or the red-belted bumblebee. Uh, this one, I am sorry to say, is uh, really not fair <laughs> because there are some morphs of females who have no red on them at all. So the common name, the red-belted bumblebee, is misleading. Uh, they are smaller bees than most of the other bumblebees. So they have very short, round faces. Uh, and again, that color pattern can vary. But if there's a red morph, uh, like the female on the left or the male down here, those tend to not be very clearly delineated. So kind of the, the border between the yellow and the red, there'll be some intermingling of those hairs and it will usually not be on the edge of an abdominal segment. So it's not as, not as clear as Bombus tenarius. Also starting at the front, it'll be yellow, red, and then black. Uh, there will be no yellow following that orange or red. Uh, we tend to have just these two morphs in Minnesota. Um, nationwide, they can get even more complicated and, and less reliable. So lucky that we just have these two here. So an example, I think that, I mean, again, that red's a little variable but it's darker. I think it's less kind of jarring than the orange of Bombus ternarius. And you can see that there's no yellow in between and that this border is not as clear. They blend together a little bit more, but that kind of smaller, you could say cuter shape. All right, and here we are at the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Uh, famous in Minnesota for being our new state bee, but uh, unfortunately chosen primarily because it is our one endangered bee species in Minnesota. So it was federally listed as endangered in 2017 uh, because populations were documented to have abruptly crashed. Um, we still see them around the metro area, sometimes northern Minnesota, some uh, southern Minnesota. In the last couple of years, of all the rusty patch bumblebees seen in the U.S., about 30 percent of them have been in Minnesota. Uh, for, you know, a fairly rare, kind of hard to find bee, it's hard to know is that because we have a lot of people looking for them in Minnesota? Is that because we have more of them in Minnesota? We find a lot in the metro area. Do they prefer urban areas? Do we just have a lot more people looking for them? Again, things that are that are really hard to suss out. But again, they do seem to show up in Minnesota more. The theory behind, the kind of working theory currently behind their population drop 
was that uh, the Bombus affinis and then Bombus tericola, the yellow banded bumblebee, are both the same subgenus. And they seem to be more affected by a um, it's nosema, I think it's a microsporidium that came from introduced bumblebee colonies. So colonies were bred to do pollination in mostly greenhouses for things like tomatoes that rely on buzz pollination. Uh, you know, this pathogen was not terribly dangerous to its host, but it's turned out that these two species just do not tolerate it very well. Uh, so the timeline of those, that introduction and then the population declines of Bombus tricola and Bombus affinis uh, line up. So this is maybe unfairly as well, the one species in Minnesota where the queens and the female workers do not look the same. Uh, the queens do not have a rusty patch. However, you're much more likely to see the workers and the males than the queens, so don't let it trip you up too much. So they also have that yellow or that black thumbtack shape that the uh, that Bombus ternarius had. But uh, looking at their abdomens, the yellow, this brown that is completely surrounded by yellow on the sides and the front and the back, and then the rest of the abdomen will be black. Black hairs in their heads. Uh, they also, let's see, I think it's the next one. They have short tongues, uh, short for a bumblebee, still relative to their size, longer than our tongues would be. Um, so this means that they are frequent nectar robbers. So instead of going to the front of the flower, interacting with the pollen, with all the other reproductive parts, they'll sneak into the side, cut a little slit, and then just drink the nectar from the side. Uh, so they're not doing the flower any good, but they are getting the nectar that they need. Sorry, get my mouse on the right screen. Wow, okay, so I'm seeing Angie's question about Bombus rubosinctus and the different morphs. Uh, I have, unfortunately, no answer for you. <laughs> I don't know, uh, it just, there are some that are different. They tend within one colony uh, to be the same. But I think just there's variation in species. Uh, so this map here showing, if we look at those white dots, uh, those are more recent sampling. So again, finding a couple across, you know, in Minnesota, reaching eastward. But those black dots and then the polygon drawn outside them, how common they used to be. How they were or more were found sampling before 2002. So the overall range is not that much different, but if you look at the number of dots, we're really finding fewer individuals. Aha, look at this, Claire, great minds think alike. So this is an image of the map that Claire linked to in the comments, uh, produced by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So the whole gray area is the historic range for rusty patch bumblebees. Those red areas are high potential zones. Usually that's where an individual has been documented. And then the yellow is sort of, they have some algorithm, you know, where around that other point you might be likely to find them. I think it con considers land use. I'm not entirely sure. Again, it's, I'm sure it's pretty complicated. But so those areas, either the red or the yellow, are the areas that you're not allowed to handle bumblebees without a permit on the chance that one of them could be a rusty patch bumblebee and could come to some harm. Uh, this map is updated fairly frequently. So we submit any finds from our volunteers to the Fish and Wildlife Service, but also they pull data from iNaturalist and Bumblebee Watch. Um, certainly other researchers report to them as well. So moving on, I mentioned that Bombus tricola had, was in the same subgenus as Bombus affinis. Uh, so another bee that's experienced some decline, uh, they tend to be kind of small round bees, but they get their name, the yellow banded bumblebee, from these yellow hairs at the end of the abdomen. 
I always think it looks kind of like a tutu. Uh, they're just a little bit longer than the rest of those black hairs. But lots of black on the thorax going back. Uh, and then the abdomen will have a black segment, two yellow segments, and then the rest black again with that little fringe. So very short round faces. Uh, they are also nectar robbers like Bombus aphidus, where they'll sneak in the side of the flower to get the nectar. Uh, they were up for listing as endangered species. And then last summer it was determined that although populations were down, uh, they were not threatened. They were still seen as viable. They did not need to be listed. More common in Northern Minnesota. So, Anne, your question, did you have them in Duluth? Entirely possible. Yep. All right, so a couple. Um, I will, I think for the sake of time, I'll talk through these, uh, but you're certainly welcome to add questions. So remember we have just two species that this could be with yellow, two segments of orange and then yellow, one segment yellow and then black. Uh, obviously, from just the photo, you're not going to know if this is Bombus huntii or Bombus ternarius, uh, but it is Bombus ternarius, the tricolored bumblebee. A female, you can see that big ball of pollen there. All right, so another sort of dead giveaway, these pollen balls here. So a female. And this is Rufosinctus. So looking at how that the change between the yellow and the red is not exactly along the line of the abdominal segments. Uh, they kind of blend together there. And there's no yellow following that red. All right, sort of can joke and say the reason we're all here, uh, bees have gotten incredibly popular in Minnesota, particularly the rusty patch bumblebee. But again, looking, this is a specimen, not a, not a live bee like the rest of them, but noting that that rusty patch, it has yellow surrounding it. That is the front, the back, and the sides. Um, we can't see much of that thumbtack shape here, but it is there. Uh, this is a female. It's a question about pollen coming off from flower to flower. So bumblebees and honeybees, because they're carrying those pollen in their pollen baskets, um, they've mixed it with a little bit of nectar and sort of patted it together. Uh, I have heard pollen baskets called cargo pockets for bees. I'm um, kind of putting that on. So say na other native bees that carry their pollen loose on their hairs um, do spread more of it from flower to flower and it's much easier to brush off when it's just a couple of pollen grains on the hairs. Um, I, I guess that maybe I don't know it for sure, but I suspect that for bumblebees and honeybees that are collecting this and manipulating it, more of the spreading probably happens, you know, kind of as they're gathering. Um, they'll be covered in pollen and then they can groom themselves. They have little combs on their legs. So I suspect that that is a time that more of that pollen would be transferred to the flower. Uh, if you ever get to see a video of bees doing this and sometimes they comb their antennae, it almost looks like a cat grooming themselves. It's pretty cute. All right. So one more to guess. And again, something that you would not know uh, the geography from the photo. But again, looking at, even though the photo is not in focus, how clearly those colors are um, limited to the segments. So a male ternarius. But I do like to have photos like this in, just to show you that if you are out taking pictures to submit to Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist, um, a lot of people feel really pressured to submit these wonderful photos. Uh, but something like this is very useful for identification. Uh, it adds to the body of data that we have about what bees live where. 
it doesn't matter that it's not completely in focus, that it's not something that we would maybe print out and put on our wall as art, but it does show the characteristics that we need for identification. Uh, I have submitted many slightly blurry <laughs> or, you know, sort of miscropped photos where the bee has just barely left the frame as I was taking the picture. And again, they can still be useful. So we do have a little break here before we get into some of the tougher species, um, things that you're more likely to need a microscope for, but I still want you to know about um, so that if you're out taking pictures in particular, you know what you need photos of to help other people identify them. But I'll give you a little bit. You can put a comment in the, or a question in the chat. Uh, you can unmute and ask it live if you'd like. Brad, I maybe missed your answer, but there was a question about um, back to Aphinus, if there are similar species that are also nectar robbers, or is that a possible additional indicator of Aphinus? Uh, Bombus tericula is another frequent nectar robber, uh, the bees that have short tongues. I don't think it'd be terribly helpful in ID because it's hard to catch them in the act. <laughs> Right, hard to see that that's the individual who's cutting that little slit at that very moment. Yeah. And I see a question about a species that's the best pollinator. Uh, in, in bumblebees, they are all generalists. The fact that they have their colony going throughout our summer in Minnesota means that they have to be able to visit several different kinds of flowers, right? Flowers, different shapes, flowers that are open at different points in the year. Some of our other native bees uh, are specialists. They're only active for a few weeks of the year, and so they rely much more on specific flowers. Uh, and in turn, those specific flowers will rely more on those exact bees. So there is a species of Andrina that is a specialist on spring beauties. Uh, so those flowers need that bee that bee is used to that flower. Bumblebees, you know, aren't always able to get into tinier flowers, but uh, some things like lobelia or flowers that have a keel, those bumblebees are just big enough that they can push their way in, whereas a little bee might not be able to do that. They can also buzz pollinate. So the bumblebees will kind of unhook their wings from their wing muscles and then vibrate those muscles at a certain frequency. So this helps for flowers from plants uh, like peppers, tomatoes, and the Solanaceae family, whose pollen is tucked up. So the bee wouldn't just you know, rub across it or walk near it while getting the pollen or nectar. But that, that vibration, that, that frequency, knocks that pollen out. Uh, I saw a citizen science project in Seattle, actually, where they found that frequency. They had volunteers out with tuning forks that they would hold next to tomato plants and then kind of watch that pollen rain down. Uh, science is amazing. All right, so I'm looking at a couple of questions about pictures. Uh, what would you like to see? Ideally, everything. <laughs> so getting a picture of the back, a picture of the side, and a picture of the face. Uh, is, is most helpful. Because again, we'll get into this next batch of tricky ones, and so we might need to see more than one characteristic to be very sure. And then a question about foraging range. Uh, not as far as honeybees, usually farther than other native bees. So honeybees can be going up to a couple miles. I don't know, but bumblebees go that far. Uh, but I don't have a specific number for you, unfortunately. All right, I think we've had time for questions to pop up. So, dun dun dun, the tricky species. Starting with Bombus felinus, you know, pretty common. You find them in like warm laundry baskets. Haha, <laughs> obviously, not a bumblebee. Just getting you, shake it out, right? Don't get stressed out just because I told you these next ones are hard. Again, uh, I've been working on this for years and I would say that I'm pretty good, but not an expert. You know, these things take practice. Uh, and this is an hour and a half webinar. Don't get discouraged if you find these next ones hard. 
So the ones that are similar, I've put up in pairs. Uh, we'll start with Bombus oricomus, the black and gold bumblebee, and Bombus pennsylvanicus, the American bumblebee. They both tend to be pretty large. Uh, one notable thing, their wings are pretty dark. Um, again, these color patterns, pretty similar. Sometimes you look out with the males of Pennsylvanicus that they have this orange at the tip of their uh, abdomen. That's not going to be all of them, unfortunately. So again, the females in particular look very similar. The males, not quite as much. Again, looking at photos, something that uh, for beginners, you're probably not going to be able to, to identify. But if you are taking photos that you would submit to Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist, there are a couple of things that, uh, that would be very helpful if we could see. So one is a view of the face. So the acelli labeled here are those three little dots. They're simple eyes. Uh, they notice changes in light, movement, uh, more than forming images. The compound eyes are on the side. They kind of are these you know, kidney bean shaped things. So where the ocelli are in relation to the rest of the, the compound eye is a clue. And something that's much easier seen if you've got a lot of practice or if you have a specimen and you can really take the time and zoom in and look at it. Uh, not something you'll see in the field, but good to be aware of. Uh, and the other thing that you are, again, not going to see in the field, so don't uh, stress about it too much. But looking at this spine here, so Oricomus has a much shorter spine. Pennsylvanicus, uh, it's a bit longer. The one thing that does trick people, trip people up, uh, particularly when we do this in person with specimens, is that there is also kind of a claw over here that all bumblebees have. So it is unfortunately more subtle than you think. But another good reason to have a nice side view of a photo that you can submit uh, if you're using Bumblebee Watch or a naturalist. So another tricky pair, Bombus fervidus, or the golden northern bumblebee, and Bombus borealis, the northern amber bumblebee. Uh, they are, again, very similar color patterns for both males and females, where the black stretches from wing base to wing base, and then the most of their abdomen is yellow. Uh, but if we look at them side by side for females, and there are a couple differences. So Obama's fervidus has black hairs on the head. The side of the thorax is yellow. But then Bombus borealis has yellow hairs on their heads and then brown, black or brown underneath the wings on the side of the thorax. So again, another, another plea for if you get a picture of the side, <laughs> this can help us with identification. So then here, seeing the yellow down here under the wing bases and the darker brown or black on borealis. Uh, you know, I assume that Borealis looking just a little droopier over here <laughs> and not quite symmetrical is probably just a mistake in rendering. Uh, you wouldn't expect them to look that way in real life. All right, so looking at the males, again with Pennsylvanicus, you might luck out and have some orange at the tip of the abdomen. Uh, but for, to tell it apart from Fervidus and Borealis, or to tell Fervidus and Borealis apart, uh, you can use those kind of same clues from the females about the colors of hairs on their head and the side of the thorax. Pennsylvanicus will tend to have more yellow, but unfortunately it's one of those, or more black. And the thorax, but unfortunately it is not always that way. All right, so one more, uh, Bombus Vegans, Bombus Sandersoni. Uh, a lot of 
folks even in the bee practice people in the bee world will just list both of these as two striped bumblebees because those first two abdominal segments are yellow the rest of the abdomen is black um, that they are just kind of that hard to tell apart if you don't have the specimen in front of you so it's a category on bumblebee watch even just to call it a two stripe bee uh, Bombus vagans will have a longer face so that can be helpful and the antennae if you have a specimen or if you have a really good photo um, they will look a little different so Bombus sanersoni will have fringed hairs on their antennae or uh, the third antennal segment and Bombus vagans will have a smooth segment there So here they are in person. I often think that Bombus sanersoni just in general looks a little more beat up, uh, which of course is not a very scientific characteristic. Um, but I, you know, they're just a little more ragged, I think, a lot of the time. So here's again with the face, that long, long face of Vegans, and sort of more medium face that sanersoni has. But looking at the antennae, how there are hairs here, not third segment that Vegans does not have. And then the length of the second and third segments too. Again, not something that you would ever be able to notice in the field. So it is possible from some photos, but again, knowing there are characteristics, but uh, if you're unable to tell them apart, don't beat yourself up. They're pretty subtle. Uh, taxonomists, you know, to be really sure about many of these things will they have to have specimens and they'll pull genitalia out, which again is nothing that I expect any of you to do, but knowing what other people do uh, to be more sure about identification. So our last one, which I think just has the best name ever, Bombus perplexus or the confusing bumblebee. Interestingly enough, I actually don't think it is super confusing. <laughs> it is the one bumblebee that we have where there is not a lot of uh, there's no obvious black spot on the thorax between the wing bases. They are variable and so kind of how things shake out might be a little different. Uh, I mostly see them this kind of darker yellow color, which I think is different from most of the other bumblebees. Nothing quite that shade, um, but then these three yellow segments, uh, the rest of it will be black. This one is a male, you can see in this picture that the long antennae are nicely extended for you. Let's see. All right, again, for time, uh, sorry to rush you through this. This is taking a little longer than our last session, uh, but a couple of quizzes and then we have a short break and I'll get to ways that you can contribute to citizen science. All right, so again, we can't see everything about this, but we can see that most of the abdomen is yellow. We can see long antennae. So this is a male Bombus borealis. The cl main clue being a little bit yellow on the top of the head, but these black hairs under the wing bases. This is another Griseocolis. You can see that brown segment a little better than that first photo that we used, but again, the round, sort of beefy thorax, uh, and those short hairs that stick out a little bit more. This is a Bombus oricomus. If you were submitting a picture to Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist, I uh, would probably leave it at that it's either oricomus or Pennsylvanicus. So if we were quizzing you, I would accept both answers. All right, uh, this one is Bombus tericola. So the little yellow fringe, but mostly that almost entirely round, they're kind of like little pom-poms, I think. A lot of black on the thorax, and then just those few, that fringe of yellow hair there. Uh, that one's a female. And then this last one, it is a male Bombus vegans. You can see these first two yellow stripes from the long antennae, uh, but would take it as either you know, Bombus vegan slash Sandersoni two stripe bumblebee. 
um, whichever you need. All right, so we will end with ways that you can use your newfound knowledge to contribute to community or citizen science. So some of you may be familiar with the Minnesota Bumblebee Survey. These are Twin Cities based events that Elaine Evans has been running for many years. Uh, she would go to a site three times throughout the summer, invite people to meet her there to catch bumblebees, they identify them together and then release all of them. Uh, this has changed to an individual project this summer with concerns about the spread of COVID. Um, and so you'll be able to, it'll be a combination of uh, taking photos and then documenting uh, what you see not collection based uh, so that it's safe to do in particularly in metro yards. You got not needing a permit from Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Bumblebee Watch, the URL is up there, but it is also an app for both iPhones and Android. Uh, Bumblebee specific, run by the Xerce Society. So you have to have an account, you'll have a picture, It'll walk you through a key, so you'll give it your best guess of what you think it is. Uh, and then they have a panel of experts who will verify all those photos. Uh, you can also participate in the backyard bumblebee count. This will be the second year, much like the Christmas bird count, the idea that for one week of the year, get as many people out looking for bumblebees as we can. Scheduled one, rusty patch bumblebees should be particularly active. Uh, this is using iNaturalist. So again, both a website and an app. So you can use it on your phone. You can take pictures on any kind of camera, submit them online. Uh, iNaturalist is similar to Bumblebee Watch in that way that you're submitting photos, but it is actually for any living thing. And so you can keep track of lots of organisms that is not uh, verified per se by experts. You can put things up there with whatever identification you feel confident in. You know, it could be just insect, could be just plant, uh, and then other users will come by and add IDs. So those could be, you know, other amateur naturalists, but there are quite a few uh, kind of big wigs in the bee world, like John Asher, who has written some keys for Discover Life. Uh, he's on quite a bit adding identifications. So you, can, you might have several recommendations for one photo. Uh, you can look things up or kind of go with community consensus. Uh, there's also the Minnesota Bee Atlas. So we have a bit more of a structured protocol. So all those little bee icons are routes, uh, roadside collection routes that are mapped out. And so you would visit that route three times throughout the summer, collect at five points. Uh, any species that are easily identified, you can just tally and uh, release. If they are trickier, we provide this photo tube. And so you can, of course, this little Vegans is too small to really sit in that depression very nicely. Uh, but it's a way to hold them still so that you can take better pictures to get the face, to get the sides. Uh, and then we will vet those photos. If you find Bombus affinis, uh, we do need to know about it right away, is basically the message of that slide. We have been uh, doing this for four years so far. From a distance, these graphs look a lot alike, but I just wanna point out that the scale changes. So we've had more people out every year, uh, collecting more bumblebees, uh, and the, the most commonly found species have changed. But I just wanna caution you that because we're using volunteers, using, that sounds kind of negative, because we have volunteers helping us collect data, uh, right, we get data from the points where we have people volunteering. Uh, it's not, we can't tell them exactly where to go. And so sometimes those changes are due to where volunteers are. And it might not exactly be that a certain species is more common one year than the next. But other than that, we have, uh, we are right at 2.30. I can stay on for as many questions as you have. <laughs> 